Hello, everyone. It's 12.02, so let's get started. I'm Kate Allen, Managing Editor for Patient Safety, and will be moderating this afternoon. It is my privilege and my pleasure to present the star of today's program, Regina Hoffman. Regina is the Executive Director of the Patient Safety Authority, an independent state agency that oversees event reporting and patient safety for Pennsylvania. She serves as Editor-in-Chief for Patient Safety, a quarterly peer-reviewed journal with more than 50,000 readers worldwide. She is here today to answer your questions about academic publishing, including the life cycle of a manuscript during publication, how the peer review process works, and some tips for anyone who's been asked to do their first review. So thank you to everyone who submitted their questions ahead of time. Please put any additional questions in the chat and we will try to get to them at the end if there's time. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right, thank you, Kate. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me because uh, it looks like my microphone is off, is off, so or my mute is off. So thank you, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's exciting to see so many people here today. Um, it's wonderful. Um, my goal for the next thirty minutes is hopefully to alleviate some of the anxiety that you might be having around submitting a manuscript for publication. Whether you are thinking about submitting your very first manuscript or you've submitted many manuscripts over the course of your career. And I hope to do that by demystifying the process a little bit for you. But before we do that, I wanted to just share just a little bit about myself as it relates to this journal. Um, so prior to September of 2019, I had never served as an editor for a journal. I had never even been part of the process of publishing a journal before then. So it's been a learning experience um, and it's been a great journey. Um, many of our articles that we've published have been submitted by first time authors. So I guess my point to all this is you are in good company. It's been a learning experience for all of us and it will continue to be a learning experience for all of us. The reason we embarked on this journey at the Patient Safety Authority is because we saw a need to have something different. We really wanted a publication that was going to reach all audiences and all people that can really impact patient safety. So not just the academic researcher, um, we wanted to also reach the patient safety officers. We wanted to reach nurses and physicians and pharmacists and patients. It was really important for us that we included patients in our work. So our journal is one of the few that actually carries the designation of patients included. And what that means is we always have at least two editorial board members who are patients. We have patients who regularly contribute to the journal by submitting editorials, participating in interviews, et cetera. We have patients who take part in the peer review process and we're open access. And that was the other thing that was really important to us when we went about creating this journal. We wanted this journal to be available to all people. So when I say open access, what I mean is we don't charge subscription fees to our readers. We also don't charge fees to you, the authors. And that's important to note. If you've um, submitted to other journals, if you want your manuscript published and you want it published open access where people don't have to pay to read it, oftentimes you will be charged as an author. So once your manuscript is accepted for publication, then you get charged a fee. So we don't do either one. We wanted to make sure that this journal was available to anyone who wants to read it and that we really that there was no barriers that we were putting in place to any author from having their work published especially people you know who work for smaller organizations or who have very limited funding um, so that's why we went the route that we route and we're very we're very happy um, with where we are so that said I'm going to I'm going to turn it back to Kate for a second because she's going to kind of throw the questions out there and again thank you for submitting so many ahead of time. Um, some of them we were kind of able to group together and actually do a couple little slides um, to better answer them. So what do we have up first, Kate? Up first, we have, what are the big steps between once a manuscript has been submitted and publication? And the, uh, we had several people kind of ask that question or variations of that question. So there's a, when you submit your manuscript, there's obviously there's a lot of steps that happen between the time you submit it and when you publish it, but here are some of the key ones. So you submit, you write your manuscript and you, you send it in. The first thing that happens is generally Kate gets a hold of it and she, she reads it. So she's looking initially to see, you know, does it really, does it meet the mission of our journal or, you know, maybe we got a, 
a submission that really belongs somewhere else. So, and she does a plagiarism check. So right out of the gate, those are two things. Does it meet the mission of the journal? Um, and did it pass the plagiarism check? Those are really important. And then she sends it to me. And I look at it you know, for the same things. Again, does it meet the mission? And that first glance at it, I, I'm looking at kind of the package. Um, you know, is it well written? Does it make sense? Um, what value does it add? Um, and at that point, I also share it with our data editor. So we are fortunate to have a biostatistician on our staff, Sean Kepner, who looks at every article that comes in, all of our research articles from a data standpoint to make sure that what you're submitting doesn't make sense. Are there any glaring errors in it? Um, what could be tightened up before it goes to peer review? So Kate looks at it, I look at it, Sean looks at it, and then we make a decision. Is it okay to go to peer review at that point? Or do we have some comments for you that is going to make your manuscript better. Our goal is when it goes to peer review, we want your manuscript to be in the best shape it can be because we want you to be successful in this process. So once we have it, maybe you make some more revisions to it, then we send it out to peer review. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more depth in a few minutes. So our peer reviewers, they took a, they look at your manuscript and they're looking at it very specifically for a couple things, like I said, that, that we'll share. And then they send that feedback back to us. Um, so we look at the feedback. I read their comments, make sure, you know, they make sense. I understand what they're saying. And we compile them, we de-identify them, and then I send them, we send them back to the authors. So you get that feedback from the peer reviewers. Um, and then you have an opportunity to look at it and either make revisions to your manuscript or maybe you don't agree with the comment. And that's okay too. That's important. Now, if, if you see a comment from a reviewer and you think, you know, it's off base, it doesn't make sense. You don't have to make a revision to your manuscript. What we are looking for at that point is for you to provide kind of an explanation as to, you know, why you don't agree or what might be missing there. So you review your manuscript again, and then it comes back to us um, another time. So I then look at your new revised manuscript, and I compare it to what were the reviewers' comments, and at that point, try to make a determination whether you know the revisions that you've made and the comments that you made, whether it satisfactorily um, addressed the concerns of the reviewers. And at that point, it might have, and then it moves on in the process to copy edit, it, copy edit, and lay out, and gets published. Or there might be some comments that the reviewers made that might be a little bit more complex, or maybe ones that you didn't agree with. Um, and those we may send, I may send back to that original reviewer just to take another look to make sure that we're all in agreement. And once we're in agreement, you know, by that, I mean the editorial team, the authors and the reviewers, then again, we send it through the process that goes to copy edit and to layout. And you're going to see that your article at least two more times, um, once after copy edit and once after layout to make sure everything, you know, looks okay. Um, nothing inadvertently changed. Everything is appropriate. And then it goes to publication. Great. All right. Um, next question. What are the different kinds of peer review and which do you use for patient safety? So a good question. Um, so generally, you'll find three different kinds of peer review um, when you submit a manuscript to a journal. The first is open peer review. And that's where you have you as the author, you know who the reviewer is and the reviewers know who the author is. Um, there's definitely some advantages and some disadvantages to doing that. One of the advantages is it's a little bit easier to find peer reviewers. Um, as I'm sure Kate will confirm, that's not always an easy task um, because again, these are people that are working generally full-time jobs and they're volunteering their time. So when you have open peer review, a lot of times you'll have an author that can then recommend reviewers because they know people in the field. They know other researchers doing the research or people that are very involved in whatever that topic is. Some of the downside to that is potential bias, you know, when the two parties um, know who each other is, or sometimes a lack of transparency. If you're a reviewer and you know that, you know, the author knows your name and knows who you are, you may hold back a little bit in your transparency and we may not get as, um, as good of a review back or as transparent as we would otherwise. Um, some journals use a single blinded process. And by that means, uh, by that I mean, uh, the reviewer knows who the author is, but the author doesn't know who the reviewer is. And some of those concerns are the same. What we use at patient safety is the double blinded process, which means our authors don't know who the reviewer is and the reviewer doesn't know who the author is. And again, we think that that gives us um, the most robust process for our purposes. 
It's really a, a follow-up question to this is, how does peer review work? Okay, so as I mentioned, after you send your manuscript in, we look for peer reviewers. Um, and there is no magic to this. That is generally Kate and I sitting on a Zoom call or a Teams call or on the phone saying, who do you know? Who do we know that does this? Who do we know that's researched this? Where sometimes, you know, we're looking uh, online to see who's published articles on this topic, you know, other credible researchers, people that we know, and we're looking for all perspectives. So generally, we are looking for about three reviewers for each original research type article. Um, oftentimes, one of those reviewers will be patient. Um, they will generally be someone, again, that works in that field that may be published in that field and also someone that is closer to the bedside. Um, so if we are, we actually just recently published a manuscript on um, tonsillectomies and postoperative bleeds. We wanted to make sure when we looked for a reviewer for that, that we had an ENT involved. Um, that was really important. So again, we're looking for that hands-on experience, the more academic experience, as well as when appropriate, you know, the, the patient perspective from them. So once we have our peer reviewers, we reach out, you know, by email or phone and we say, you know, hey, we have this article. We kind of, we give them a summary of what it's about. We don't send the article at that point in time and ask, do they have the interest and also the capacity in their schedules to complete the review? Once they say yes, you know, your manuscript is de-identified and it's sent to the reviewer. And generally we ask them to have it back in about three weeks. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Again, especially during the pandemic, these are people working full-time jobs, they're physicians, they're nurses, just you know, like all of you pharmacists, and they're doing this in their own time. So sometimes that process can take a while. And I would say from our authors, sometimes that can be a source of frustration because you're waiting and you think that, oh my gosh, you know, there might there must be a lot wrong with it. And there's not. It's just a matter of time. It's sitting on someone's desk waiting to get done. So sometimes that takes a little bit of time. Um, once the reviewers, they have it, we send them, there's a standard format that they use. This is a copy of the first page of that form. And we ask them very standardized questions. You know, does the title, you know, is it interesting? Does it draw the reader in? Um, how is the methodology sound that the authors used? Are their conclusions well supported, et cetera? So once they complete this, they send it back to us. Like I said, then we, we review it, compile it, and send you the feedback so that way you can, you know, make the revisions that are appropriate to your manuscript. Another real follow-up for this is, what do you consider when deciding whether to accept a manuscript for peer review? I think um, that goes back to, I think, some of those earlier comments. We're really, out of the gate, we're looking for, again, does it meet the mission of the journal? Is it patient safety related? Um, as we go forward, we may look at, you know, we get a, a fair number of manuscripts that are medication error related, which is fine. But there may come a point um, in our journal's lifespan that, we have so many of those that we may say, you know what, we don't need an, we don't need another medication error article right now because we have several in the queue that we're waiting to publish. So that one might not get to peer review because we didn't accept it at that point in time. Um, looking at, you know, is the data sound, is your data analysis sound, is the research sound? Uh, and if all those things check the box, then they're generally making it um, to peer review at that point. What about once the peer review process is finished and that how do you decide whether you're going to accept a manuscript for a publication? Generally, we are, I mean, we go through the peer review process to get expert opinions and perspectives on the papers. So in any journal, the final decision always lies with the editor, whether something gets published or not. I can, and I can only speak from my perspective, not from other editors' perspectives. I rely very heavily on those peer reviews. So if we, you know, if we send the article out for three reviews, I'm generally looking for consensus. You know, everybody is pretty much in agreement. You know, this, paper, you know, we should publish this paper. Sometimes we'll get some back. We'll, we'll get two reviewers that say, you know, this is great. Yep, go ahead and publish it. And then we'll get one reviewer that it's like a flat out rejection. It's like, oh, like how can they be so different? So what we try to do in those cases is we really look at um, what were the reasons, work with the author. See, can those can those issues be addressed and get it to a point for that third reviewer that it's acceptable to them? They're okay. They're okay signing their name on that review and saying, you know, this is acceptable for publication. It may not be a hundred percent what they want, but again, we're, we're, we're looking for that consensus amongst the reviewers um, that they're all recommending it for publication. Um, 
Along those lines, another big man, uh, milestone in publication is not only your first acceptance, but also your first rejection. So someone asked, help, I've been rejected, now what? Uh, you know, it's, gonna ha it's going to happen. The rejections happen, it happens. And I think what, what some people, it's not always a reflection on your paper or the way it was written or the quality of it at all. It's important to know that for journals, when you're going through the, for us, you know, we started this journal in September of 2019. To become indexed in an index, say like in PubMed, that's a multi-year process. When we submit that application, one of the things that they look for is what's our rejection rate? They want to know that you are rejecting papers because they want to make sure that you're not just accepting everything that comes across your email, that you're being selective and you're publishing the best of the best. So that's kind of built into the process. There's an expectation that some manuscripts are going to be rejected. From an author standpoint, it's important for you to understand why to the best of your ability. If your article is rejected because it didn't meet the mission um, or the purpose of that journal or that journal, you know, they just, we have too many medication error manuscripts at any one point in time. And, you know, we have 20 waiting in the queue to be published and yours gets rejected. You may want to look for another journal. I mean, there may be other journals that fit the bill that you can then submit your article to. What you can't do is you can't take your article and submit it to multiple journals at the same time. But once you have a rejection from one, you can go ahead and submit to another. So if that's the reason I would encourage, you know, find another journal um, to submit your article to because it might be accepted. If there are other reasons, um, when we provide feedback, if we have a rejection, we try to give, you know, some of the reasons why, because I think that's helpful going forward for the authors, maybe if they're going to rework that article, oftentimes we'll say, you know what, we're rejecting it, but if you could do these things, you know, resubmit it. Um, and usually those are more than revisions. It's a major rework, but the topic might be really interesting and might be really valuable. So you might get some feedback from an editorial team saying, you know, here are some things that you could do differently. And we really recommend resubmitting it. Um, if you're not getting that type of feedback from an editor, you can always ask for more feedback. I would I wouldn't approach it as in, here's why I think you should publish the article after you've been rejected, but ask the questions, you know, the more, what, what's the constructive criticism, because that's going to help you uh, going forward. Um, and I think some people will be more forthcoming with that than others. But again, it's not, it's not always the quality of your manuscript. It just might be the, the wrong timing for the journal that you sent it to. Thinking about this on the other side, someone wrote in and said that it's their first time reviewing a paper. So they wanted to know if you had any tips that they could consider. Yes, <laughs> at least for our journal, um, the format, it, it's pretty standardized. What's helpful for us is, you know, I want you, as you can see in this one, you can pick, I think, poor, fair, good, or excellent in all of these categories. It's great, you know, we want you to pick what it is, but comments are really, really helpful. Particularly if you're saying something is poor or fair, or even if it's good or excellent, it's important, you know, why, why did you think that? But more so if, you were, if you're saying it's just fair or if it's poor, it's important for the authors and for myself to understand why when we review your comments. If you are reviewing for us and it's your first time and you have a question, don't hesitate to reach out to Kate or to myself. We're more than happy to help, you know, kind of walk you through it. But we're asking you to review an article for your expertise in the content. Um, some things that we get back that unfortunately, that I know they take a lot of time and we appreciate that, but aren't as helpful is a copy, the, a copy edit to the manuscript. Sometimes we'll get a reviewer and they take the time they're going through, they're doing spell checks and grammar checks. You don't need to do that. Um, we're Again, we want you to spend your time using your expertise on the topic, not copy editing, copy editing or trying to copy edit the manuscript. When it comes to you as a reviewer, it hasn't gone through copy edit yet because we, tr we try very hard to do things one time if we can. So we wait until the manuscript is ready. You know, it's pretty much complete. It's finished. It's through the peer review process. Then it goes through copy edit. So we're doing that one time. So that's something people sometimes spend time on. And we tell them, um, don't do that because it's not, it's not as helpful. Again, we want your comments specific to, to the content. 
anything else that you can think of, Kate, that we get back at? Because I'm usually our reviews are are, are fairly good. The, the ones that are least helpful are the ones where it's just kind of check. There's a check in each box and there's no comments. And, you know, there, it's hard to, again, especially if it says fair or poor, to get anything useful out of that. Agreed. Because someone else asked about how detailed they should be because they're concerned that they were they're being picky. But it, the more detail we get, the more that we can work with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Be picky on the content. Don't be picky on the on the grammar, etc. The other thing to keep in mind is we we've had a fair number of manuscripts that have come from outside of the country, so international manuscripts, and they're coming to us. They're coming to us in English, and they're generally, you know, they're they're pretty good. But we haven't worked, and we're willing to work with those authors before publication to make sure that you know, from a readability standpoint, everything is accurate, but when it's going to the reviewer, so that that hasn't happened yet. It's always going to you at a point, you know, you can understand it and you can do the review, but don't get caught up on that kind of detail. Again, stick to the to the content. It's gonna be a better use of your time and it's more useful for us. Speaking of the content, someone asked, what topics or types of articles are you specifically looking for in patient safety? So we are generally, we're looking for, I mean, if you have a topic and it's patient safety related, don't hesitate to send us. We have coming up next January, we're doing a special issue on burnout. So that's a hot topic right now. So if you have, you know, editorial type pieces, perspective pieces, research pieces, we want to see those. Um, last January, we did a special issue on, uh, from, from pharmacists. One thing from for me and for this journal is don't hesitate to send your quality improvement initiatives. A lot of people that we work with at the Patient Safety Authority are patient safety officers, they're quality improvement officers, they're people doing patient safety and quality. And generally, these you're not doing act like research, you're doing quality improvement, and those are different. Those papers are really, really important to us. Research ones are important, so is quality improvement. When you're sending those, don't hesitate. I encourage you to include your outcomes data. Sometimes we get quality improvement projects and it's it's really um, process measures based, which is great. You know, they um, you're trying to implement these processes that are supposed to, you know, make patient care safer and you've shown improvement and that's, that's wonderful. When we see the outcome data to go with it, it's definitely more compelling and it's going to bump your manuscript up on the list and more likely to be accepted, even if the outcome data isn't necessarily what you want it to be. So you go through a quality improvement project and you put these interventions in place and you didn't see the improvement that you expected in the actual patient outcome. So you didn't see the actual falls decrease or you didn't see the pneumonia decrease, even though you put these measures in place. We want to see those too. Those papers are important. And I think a lot of people kind of shy away from wanting to publish those manuscripts because again, it wasn't what you expected. It wasn't the outcome that you expected, but those are important because people learn from those. They learn from, you know, why, you know, why did you think it, it, it didn't work? What might be missing? Maybe there's interventions across the board and across the industry that we're putting in place that we think are the right thing to do, but they're not really having an impact on the patient. So those manuscripts are just as important as the ones where you've actually were able to show an improvement in the outcome. So from a personal standpoint as an editor, I'd really love to see more of those type of papers, quality improvement papers with the outcome measures included, whether they're good or not. Well, with that, that was the end of all the questions that had been pre-submitted. We do have a couple minutes left. If anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to open it up if people wanna put it in the chat. Yeah, and while we're waiting, since we do have it looks like four minutes, I wanted you to get thank you for for being here today. If you are, um, if you're thinking about submitting a manuscript, if you want it, a lot of times we'll have authors reach out to us and say, you know, would you just look at the abstract? Do you think this is something that you would be interested in? We do. You know, we will absolutely look at your abstract or even, you know, what you think, you know, what you're going to write your manuscript about. Again, it's no guarantee that it will be accepted, but we're always happy to provide feedback. Um, which can save you a lot of time because if you send something, it's like, oh, that's just not a good fit. It's better for all of us to know up front than you spend the time doing it and submitting it to us and it gets rejected. Or we're like, yeah, you know, that's a really good, it's a really good topic. We think you should pursue it. Um, I think it that's just helps have those conversations up front. So we're, we are always open to that. Uh, I see, 
one came in the chat. Would there be a consideration? I think it said for, for workplace violence. Is that what that said? Mm -hmm. Minimize something. If you have, right now, if you have an, if you have articles on workplace violence, because that workplace violence um, in healthcare is, you know, it's an issue, and we all know this. If you work in healthcare, not only um, for employees and visitors and people that work there, it's also the patients. You know, it's it's all of us that are affected. Um, when you're in that setting. So while we don't have a special issue coming up on that, we would certainly welcome any articles that you have around workplace violence because it, it is a hot topic and it's a really disheartening one. Uh, and I think everybody probably agrees with that. But the more we know about it um, and the more that we can learn, um, and I'd really be interested in seeing what kind of programs facilities have in place that you think are effective? Like, what have you done? I think we've all know that there, yes, there's, there's a, a problem and, and it's a catastrophic problem. So what are we doing to fix it? And things that we can share that other people can pick up um, would be great. Um, I think Kate, something else came in, but it, it closed on the bottom of my screen quick. Sure. So someone asked, is culture of safety still a hot topic for publications? Culture of safety is probably <laughs> a hotter topic <laughs> since last um, last week than it has been in a very, very long time. So yes, it is still a hot topic. Again, I'm. there's been a lot published on culture of safety. Um, I think everybody that works in healthcare has a fairly good understanding of it. But if there are stories, um, studies, efforts to share where we've, we've seen an impact, that would be really interesting to see. I would love to be able to publish a study where someone says, you know, they've implemented a culture of safety, you know, whenever it was, and they followed it and they've, they've seen patient safety outcomes actually get better over time or not get better over time. Again, it's, it's not just the improvement, it's, it's what is not happening. I think, you know, there's a lot of assumption that we do a lot of things um, and it's good for patient safety, but we don't have the data to support it. Um, it's not that it's not true but we can't prove it. And that's really important to a lot of groups of people. So I think the more that we can share those initiatives and their outcomes, um, it would be great. That raises a point that I don't think we touched on a lot over this last half hour is about the, the newness of a publication. Cause it does seem to be one of the reasons that we most frequently reject a manuscript is that we feel like it's not novel enough for to add to the literature. Yeah, there's, we get some great papers, but when you read them, it's like, okay, one of the things that we're looking for is does it contribute to the knowledge base? If we read it and say, like, okay, if you work in healthcare, we all kind of, we, we know this, or you work in patient safety, we know this already, a lot of people have published, and there's not a twist on it, something different in it, a lot of times those will get rejected. So the topic can be an older topic. I would say culture of safety was probably an older topic and not as hot of a topic, again, up until a few days ago. Um, but again, what's different about it? What are you doing? Have you done something different? Have you seen results from some of these older initiatives? That's really what we're looking for because we want, what we're publishing, we want it to, again, add to the knowledge base. Um, I can't tell you, even for myself, how many articles <laughs> that you get and you think like, oh, that's okay. And, and they kind of go, well, now it's on an electronic pile. It's not so much, you know, a pile on your desk anymore. You know, if people are going to read things, it has to be relevant. It has to be something new because no one has the time to sit around and read things that are just regurgitations of things we've known and read and wrote, written about for years. Well, it looks like we are at time and I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so thank you again, for everybody for coming. Regina, I'll kick this back over to you. Oh, thank you, Kate. Thanks for moderating. Again, if you had questions that you didn't ask or you think of something, um, please, you know, feel free to email us. You know, our email address is on uh, the, the Patient Safety Authority website as well as the Patient Safety, which is our journal website. So don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.